Hello and good afternoon. My name is Dee Duchon and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of the Ann Arbor area, serving all of Washtenaw County. Our chapter is very pleased to bring you this August session of our monthly Lunch and Learn series. Two of our guests today are Joan Sampiri, president of our local chapter, and Yodit Mesfin Johnson, president and CEO of NEW, which stands for Nonprofit Enterprise at Work. Our topic today is acknowledging our history to transform our future. As you know, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan civic organization that encourages informed and active participation by all citizens. The League works to increase understanding of major policy issues and seeks to strengthen and broaden knowledge about our form of government and democracy. While the League does not support candidates or parties, we do take stands on issues which we have studied. One of the League's most important goals is to assist voters in making informed choices at the polls. Study. And just to let you know, we are streaming this presentation live on Facebook and we are being recorded so that this program will be available on demand on our YouTube channel, which you can find at our website lwvnarbor.org. And the best way to view this program is on speaker view. For some of you, that will be in the upper right, and it will give you a chance to, to uh, click on speaker view, which means that whoever's speaking, their, their picture will be available. I hope you brought your lunch or at least a cup of coffee or a glass of iced tea and settle back as we begin our program. Take it away, Joan. As I was preparing for today, I came across a Thoreau quote. He said, it takes two to hear, one to speak and one to listen. Women of color have always spoken to suffragist leaders and to the League, but we haven't always listened or have listened through the buffer of what was acceptable in the dominant culture. Here were women who through revolutionary methods garnered the right to vote. Using hunger strikes, lobbying, marches, and sheer perseverance that sometimes included going to jail, they opened the door to voting and to civic engagement, just not for all women. When the League was founded in 1920, six months before the 19th Amendment was finally added to the U.S. Constitution, its intent was to educate newly enfranchised women and to encourage them to become involved. But between the intent and the reality, there were gaps. A recent book, The Untold Story of Women of Color in the League of Women Voters, by Dr. Carolyn Jefferson, Jefferson Jenkins, delves into a painful history. She was the first woman of color to serve as national president of the League's board in 1998. The second, Dr. Deborah Ann Turner, was elected this, just this year. Jefferson Jenkins says, The League of Women Voters, when it's the best version of itself, as it has been throughout certain periods of its history, is an organization to be reckoned with. When it's anything less, it is less. She examines the League's history from its founding, when it either gave lip service to the involvement and concerns of women of color or left them to the work of their own organizations. She quotes Carol Stanford Busey's research that showed in 1948, the League, founded at the culmination of a movement to end one form of inequality, was silent on the continued segregation of African Americans. The League was not addressing anti-lynching because the majority of its members weren't interested in the subject. She notes that in 1951, when the membership newsletter began, there were no images of women of color. Its symbols and visual recruitment tools reflected a white woman's organization, and it wasn't until 1964 that the League adopted a study of civil rights as part of its national agenda. For years, there was tacit acceptance that women of color could have separate leagues, but individuals should not necessarily join the existing League. 
Dr. Jefferson Jenkins says, leaguers can be the architects of a vision that moves the organization forward, truly becoming an inclusive every woman's organization by honoring all of its members and moving the accomplishments of women of color, past, present, and future, out of the footnotes and into the main narrative. The promise of racial equity only succeeds when there is an organization-wide commitment. One critical component of success is buy-in from board members and senior leaders, and that's why we at the Ann Arbor Area League have created a diversity, equity, and inclusion director's position on our board. We intend, no, we will give more than lip service to equity. We will weave it into everything we do until it becomes an organic component of the League's work. Among the things Jefferson Jenkins mentions is a key point that the Ann Arbor Area League will examine, the paradox between principle and practicality. She quotes a League president in a gathering of 11 southern states just after Brown v. Board of Education as laying out the League's dilemma, fidelity to principle versus organizational well-being. Here's where the dominant culture can be seen clearly and where we need to be aware as we build diversity, equity, and inclusion into everything we do. We've begun. Two of our members, Jackie Wolf and Chris Samita, have reached out to organizations that we have not always partnered with to do listening sessions. What is it we need to hear from you? We will be continuing their work. Today's session is the first of what will be a continuing dialogue about racial equity as we weave equity into all of the League's positions so that we represent every one of our stakeholders. And now, I'm pleased to introduce Yodit Mesfine Johnson. Yodit is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the New Center in Ann Arbor. She became President and CEO January 1st of this year. She stewards the organization's bold vision, strategic direction, and overall operations in partnership with her Board of Trustees and staff. Before joining NEW, Yodit led a, led a statewide initiative for women who are entrepreneurs. She was focusing on strengthening the entrepreneurial ecosystem by providing access to trusted guidance and capital in Michigan's under-resourced communities. She joined NEW in 2008 as a governance consultant and has had one of the longest careers with the organization ever. She became Chief Operating Officer and Vice President of Strategy from 2016 to 2019. In that capacity, she was instrumental in diversifying and growing news revenue, strengthening its partnerships and programming, including a first-of-its-kind Fellowship for Leaders of Color and White Allies, striving toward equitable outcomes for people in Washtenaw County and strengthening the organization's overall effectiveness. I am very pleased to welcome Yodit Mesfine Johnson as our facilitator and a member of our panel today and our partner as we move forward. Welcome, Yodit. Thanks so much, Joan. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, being here. And as you were speaking, <clears throat> I was thinking about kind of how I'm entering this space. Um, you know, I'm sitting in my living room in what is the occupied land of the Anishinaabawaki, Potawatomi, and Fox tribes. And I'm thinking about this theme of invisibility um, the invisibility of our indigenous brothers and sisters, certainly here locally, but throughout this nation. And to your point here with the League, um, Black women's invisibility in the League and really throughout so many of our institutions. And so it's, it's ironic as we 
consider the nomination of a Black and South Asian woman for the first time in our history's country. And I'm, I'm drawing on the, the strength and the resilience of, of my ancestors, of my grandmother, of pioneering Black women who did and continue to call our country to higher purpose while also holding up our democracy with their votes, with their action, with their leadership in every movement for civil rights that has ever happened in this country. And so today I'm, I'm here, not just as new CEO, I'm here as a mama, as a woman, at least a person occupying a woman's body. I'm here as a member of this community and I'm here not so much to facilitate a panel, but a conversation, because that is what you invited. And I'm so grateful to you and to Dee and the other women who are helping make today's program possible. But you invited and we discussed an important and needed conversation that leads to action. And so, um, I, I want to really ground those who are with us today in that this needs to be dynamic. Um, we've designed our agenda today to have us talk for about 40 minutes, and then we want to invite the audience into breakout sessions. We're going to use the Zoom technology to move you into some breakout rooms, and we want to center in our hearts. Um, I believe that we all showed up today because we care about this community and about seeing a material change in the conditions of people who are living here. And one of those conditions is that <clears throat> Black women in particular in this community, but Latinx women, Indigenous women, women of uh, other people of color, women, are largely those who are impacted by poverty, by the impact of trauma, and by the downstream impacts of a system of racism that has existed since this nation's founding. And it is the conversations today that we hope will inspire you, um, that will lead you to take action in the spaces and spheres of influence that you have. And while we're talking today, I'm gonna drop in the chat box just some, some agreements <coughs> that I hope will we'll hold throughout the next couple hours. This idea of just being present, we know that the virtual space is hard, it's not the same as when we're in community and space together physically, but please be here as much as you can. And we also understand that doggies and kids and distractions are happening and that's okay too. I ask that as, our, as I'm in conversation with Felicia and um, Des, that you listen deeply and that you listen from your heart and not just your head. That you expect that there'll be some unfinished business. That when we go to our breakouts, you'll be kind and brave. That we won't today freeze people in time. We recognize that we're on a journey and the journey of anti-racism and racial equity and justice is a lifelong journey. And so in that way, we're here to seek understanding and none of us speaks for all of us. So as you're conversating later, and I'll come back to these, I want you to consider and to, to keep, to use I statements, I feel, I saw, I experienced, I think. Before I get started, I wanted to ground us. Um, one of the things I've been noticing, there's lots of language and jargon and words <clears throat> that are moving about as we're all reckoning with the, the most recent national uprisings around race and injustice, and also as we're navigating the pandemic and the impacts that it's having. So I've asked our, the league's tech team to ground us in a quick video that I think helps to contextualize both where we're in conversation today and some talking points that I'll share after we watch the video. It's often used as a blanket term, but there's actually a whole lot more to it. There are four interlocking aspects of oppression, ideological, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized. And it might seem like a small difference, but it's very important to be able to distinguish between each kind. 
because understanding oppression is the first step to fighting it. Let's start with the core at the heart of every form of oppression, ideology. Every system of oppression comes from the idea that one group is somehow better than another. Ideological oppression starts when the dominant group associates positive qualities with itself and negative qualities with the marginalized or othered group. Ideological oppression describes the deeply ingrained social root of inequality. It's the larger overarching idea that leads to the isms. For example, the idea that black people are dangerous is ideological racism. The idea that poor people are lazy is ideological classism. Ideological oppression leads to institutional oppression. Institutional oppression is the way that systems and institutions manifest the dominant ideology. Institutions control access. Who is able to get to what and how? This includes legal rights, police practice, access to medical care and education, public policy, political power, and media representation. For example, when women make two-thirds of what men make, that's institutional sexism. When a building is constructed without wheelchair ramps, that's institutional ableism. All of this leads to interpersonal oppression. Interpersonal oppression is probably the easiest to recognize because it happens all around us. Interpersonal oppression is the way that people play out discrimination and violence on each other. It can take the form of microaggressions, jokes, stereotypes, and harassment. For example, when a student is bullied for being gay, it's interpersonal homophobia. When a Muslim person is told that they're a terrorist, it's interpersonal Islamophobia. And all those forces, ideological, institutional, and interpersonal, lead to internalized oppression. Internalized oppression is the way that people with marginalized identities internalize narratives of their own inferiority. It's what leads people to feel less than. This is the end goal of oppression. The oppressive party doesn't need to exert force any longer because the marginalized group is enacting oppression on itself to maintain the status quo. It's important to remember that it's never a marginalized person's fault that they feel internalized oppression. It's simply what happens when someone faces negative stereotypes, low expectations, and ongoing discrimination. Uh oh, maybe we need to undo that mute. I'm sorry. The four eyes of oppression are ideological, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized. Each of these types are interconnected and completely supported by the others. They can never exist on their own and can even be seen as a cycle. Now that you understand the different kinds of oppression, you're even more equipped to fight it. Don't forget that any effort to dismantle oppression should aim to address it at all four of these levels. Thanks for watching. Maybe someone can mute Mary Ellen's uh, computer. Thank you for <clears throat> thank you for sharing the video. And I wonder if our tech team will drop the link into the chat box so that folks can revisit that. I know there was a little bit of background noise. My intention in showing that was to uplift that the work that we're doing is working at all of those levels all the time. And that's been one of the things as a racial equity and justice practitioner that I've learned and that I think we need to examine. Um, we're frequently trying to build our individual and inter internal capacity to understand racism while the systemic or in institutional impacts of racism are playing out daily. And the result of that is that the impacted groups, mostly BIPOC folks and also women, right, are um, are you know, navigating that in real time. And so by looking at all of those levels and attending to them all the time, we're sort of not waiting on folks to get, get, get wake, awakened before they act. Um, the reason why it's so important for us and why Joan and I designed the panel today the way that we did is, I think our greatest opportunity is to begin to deeply listen to impacted communities. So often we're in our organizations and I'm guilty of this as well. And we're doing a bit of navel gazing, right? We're trying to figure out among ourselves how to shift our cultures, our organization, our governance, the direction of our work, our programs, our strategies. 
And given the current climate and context of racial injustice, now more than ever, we need to be listening to folks who represent those impacted communities. In fact, the work that we're doing is to create a vision for our children's grandchildren, a place where they really can thrive. And the work of racial equity is not about helping Black folks or Indigenous folks or Latinx folks or any other people of color. It is about all of us getting set free from the oppression of white dominance and white supremacy. Although you heard that I started a program of, for leaders of color and white allies, we recently changed the name of that program because it's not really allies that we need. We need co-liberators. We need folks who will actively uh, take the lead from Black leadership and not necessarily need Black leadership in order to challenge white supremacy and dominance. We need folks that will tap into the legacy of non-Black, anti-racist, and abolitionists who challenged racist structures in their own families, in their careers, and in their communities. We need folks that recognize that racial hierarchy is a myth and that there is no privilege in being um, uh, led in the hierarchy or existing in the hierarchy of racial violence, white supremacy, or as a society that re rewards one's proximity to whiteness. It is really not possible, and this is what I hope you will believe today, to be fully human as long as Black, Indigenous, and other people of color are dehumanized. And so anti-racism, I want to attribute that to Tawana Petty, uh, a adjunct professor at the University of Michigan, and also an activist, organizer, and author. And Tawana recently said that her greatest advice for white people would be to recognize that they need to be rescued from racism as well. She says about allyship that allies jump in to help put out fires, but co-liberators pursue arsonists. And that's the work we're doing today, y'all. We're doing the pursuit of arsonists. I'm so pleased to introduce two women that I have deep regard for, that I count as friends, and who have been leading in our community in amazing ways. I want to thank Felicia Brayback, Washtenaw County Commissioner of, of many things that she'll tell you, and Desiree Simmons, co-director of the Interfaith Council on Peace and Justice, and also a woman who's making impact in our community in a number of ways. Can I bring you all into the space and maybe begin by telling a little bit, uh, Felicia, we'll start with you, a little bit about yourself and the identities that are important as you're entering the space today. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Yudi. I, I love the imagery that you just shared uh, in terms of the anti-racist work that we all get to do uh, about pursuing arsonists because uh, the urgency is noted in there. Uh, yeah. And then that is so important, I think, for all of us to remember, because I think one of the things that um, folks who don't experience uh, uh, racism uh, on a daily basis uh, can have, have the opportunity and the privilege to not have to, to understand and experience that urgency uh, like yeah. we do. And so yeah. I, I really, really appreciate um, you offering that to all of us. So thank you. So uh, as Yodit said, I, um, like all of us, I wear many hats uh, uh, and uh, love all of them. Uh, and all of them really are important to me. And so Yodit mentioned that I am a Washington County Commissioner. Uh, I've, I've been able to serve in that role uh, for the past nine years, since 2011, uh, and uh, have really, uh, I have a passion for policy uh, and for being able to connect what, what I get to see in our community as uh, opportunities for us to be better uh, and then enact policy so that there's a framework uh, that through which we can do that because uh, sometimes we can't just rely on, uh, frankly, on goodwill. Yeah. Uh, and so being able to um, enact that policy uh, is, is a way that I have found makes a difference. Uh, I'm also a clinical psychologist uh, 
and also uh, have a degree in social work. Uh, and so come from with that kind of pedigree. Um, it was always my social work. Uh, it was like, you know, my first love. Uh, I, I loved what I, I was able to be a social worker um, and the community work that uh, I got to do in different places uh, and, and the policy work through that as well. Uh, and um, I became a psychologist because I, I work, I'm a therapist. So I, I, I see folks individually and do that work um, and work, furthered my education because uh, I just wanted to be better for the people I get to work with. Uh, and so I moved here uh, to Anna, Ann Arbor in 2003 uh, to do my postdoc work at U of M and uh, decided to stay. Uh, um, and and become part of the community that you know, I really liked. It. I thought, well, maybe I'll live here for a couple of years. And uh, I'm from the suburbs of Chicago. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll move back there. Uh, but really uh, became invested in the community uh, and uh, the people here. And, um, you know, my husband and I decided we chose to, to remain here, to raise our kids here, uh, and wanted to... Um, to be additive to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of my other hats uh, are like, I'm a mom and a wife. Uh, I'm also a coach. Uh, I coach our kids sports teams uh, and well, love that. Uh, the, my most recent coaching was uh, our daughter. We have our two kids, Alex and Vivian. Our, our, uh, uh, Alex is 13, Vivian is 11. And I coached Vivian's uh, basketball team for the past couple of years. Uh, uh -huh. And so that has been, uh, amazing working with those uh, those young girls and seeing them love a game that I love so much as well. Um, a little bit about why I do this work. Um, I am uh, a biracial woman. Uh, my mom is white. My dad is black. And they were married uh, a mere five and a half years after it was legal to be married in our, in our wow. country. Um, and uh, and, you know, it's important to know that there are states not that long ago, just a couple of years ago, that um, that still, even though it's a federal law uh, that folks of different races can marry, um, I think in Mississippi, I think 40 percent of the folks voted that you couldn't um, marry between races just a couple of years ago. So, you know, know that this is not that far removed. Uh -huh. um, you know, and so you know, I watched my parents navigate um, you know, things in our community. My dad was pulled over uh, two blocks from our house and asked what he was doing in that neighborhood. Um, and, um, you know, I watched, you know, as family members didn't want to talk with them. Um, and those relationships were lost. You know, I watched as my mom, my, both my parents um, were really clear with us that my sister and I have a younger sister that if we have the opportunity to give back to our communities, we have a responsibility to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Yodit talked about being able to stand on our ancestors' shoulders and reap the benefits of all of their sacrifice and work. Uh, mm -hmm. And I take that very seriously uh, and, uh, and take that to heart and try to pass it along to our kids that you know, now I, I am in a position uh, as, as an elected person and as a therapist to be able to give back. And I want to continue uh, to do that. And so uh, some of the work that I've been able to do uh, has been because of not only my personal, um, you know, my, my personal pedigree, um, but also the, what I've chosen to do professionally. Yeah. Yeah. I want to um, get Des into the space, but we're going to come back and talk about some of the things you've done um, in your your uh, professional career here for our community and maybe tie that uh, continue to tie that back to the work you're doing as a mental health provider and therapist and also how it lines up with your um, personal core values. So thank you. Thanks again thank for you. being here. Desiree, same question. Um, tell us a bit more about yourself um, and you know we are multiple identities at once and so please bring um, whichever identities feel really relevant for you in this moment into this space. Great, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, 
It's interesting, Felicia was talking about being from suburbs of Chicago and almost going back there. That's a little bit of the story for me in the sense um, I grew up in Chicago and Cleveland. Um, and so I'm definitely a Midwest, Midwesterner, Midwesterner. <laughs> and um, my family on both sides migrated north um, from uh, so Mississippi and Alabama. And uh, I've also lived in Alabama and I also lived in Boston. So I say that to say that I've lived in three regions of this country. And so understanding um, the different ways that racism uh, and classism show up in spaces, uh, I've seen it in different, in different kinds of, um, enact itself in different ways. I'm yeah. also a millennial, uh, which I feel uh, is really important part of my identity, especially in organizing spaces. Um, you know, uh, even though I'm an older millennial, I still hold true to uh, a lot of millennial um, ways of being and seeing the world um, and, uh, you know, leads a lot of the kind of questioning I do. Uh, I'm a mother, so, um, but I think I've always been a mother. I've always been a mothering person. <laughs> a lot of my friends uh, basically became my friends because they were like, you're like our mother. And so, but I do have a three and a half year old. Uh, and uh, that's such a big part of uh, my motivation and why I do things, but also I think how I approach um how I approach the world in lots of ways of just uh, really wanting to care and really hear folks and, um, you know, find ways for uh, all of us to be our best selves. Um, and then, uh, so I do, I'm a part of a lot of different organizing groups here. I live in Ypsilanti. I uh, am part of, um, I don't know, there's so many, but I do a lot of work um, around housing, affordability and accessibility, a lot of organizing both locally and statewide uh, around that issue. Um, I'm part of Liberate, Don't Incarcerate, uh, which was focused as an abolitionist group. And we ran a campaign alongside the prosecutors, the county prosecutors race. Um, uh, and um, also a part of different kind of political organi organizing as well. Um, and then most recently, I'll, I'll say um, I'm part of uh, um, What's Left Ipsy, which is a community newspaper, and then also Untold Stories for liber of Liberation and Love. And so that has now um, given me the ability to claim poet and I'm going to read a really quick poem to you all. That's Please. okay. That is absolutely um, okay. And so uh, I was going back and forth between which one I was going to read, but I'll read one um, that's called When Thousands March Forward. A thousand more answered dreams, a thousand less lives lost. A thousand more, how can I help you? A thousand less, why are you here? A thousand more hugs with loved ones, a thousand less tears from the pain of hate. A thousand more homes for the insecure, a thousand less excuses for why we can't. A thousand more nurses, teachers, farmers, a thousand more seeds rooting deep into tomorrow, mm -hmm. a thousand more secrets of survival from the ancestors. A thousand more bursts of laughter for no reason. In the land of abundance, there is always more. It is our charge to remove what was never needed. What I know to be true is more love feels best. The less we see ourselves as divided, the more connected we are to why what is was never good enough, not in a thousand years. Thank you. Oh, Des, that was beautiful. Thank you. Will you take a quick moment to just uplift the work of Untold so people know what that is? <laughs> yes, uh, of course, any opportunity to do that. So <laughs> Untold Stories of Liberation and Love, it's a project um, of 
uh, bringing together and creating space for women of color in Washtenaw County to create poetry together. Um, and so uh, we started um, last year with a, a series of workshops we did, poetry writing workshops. So you didn't have to know you were a poet to participate. Um, and um, there is a group of five uh, women, so I'm part of. Um, oh, uh, so Julie Kuros, Catalina, um, uh, oh goodness, now I'm like, Rios, right, I'm gonna, mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to look this up to get to all of our names. I never talk about our, uh, Tanya Reza, uh, yeah. Maria Barra. Um, and so we did a set of workshops. We folk, our first workshop was on mothering. Our second one was on uh, belonging home. And then we also, uh, migration. And uh, we also did one on um, survival and vision. Yeah. And so um, then during the pandemic, we did a series of poems um, from prompts. And so this is one that came out of that space. And you can find our work on liberationstories.org. And um, you also could find, uh, we also publish an anthology of poetry, which is available at Blackstone uh, Bookstore. I dropped both of those in the chat. You said liberationstories.org, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I got a chance to participate in the early, um, all, well, all but one of those writing um, and, and poetry sessions. And these are like half days um, in a space filled with women of color, which is something I rarely get to do in this community. Um, and again, with that theme of invisibility, one of the reasons we put our Leaders of Color Fellowship together was because the racial leadership gap in Washtenaw County um, is abysmal. It's less than 1% of all the nonprofits in Washtenaw County are led by a person of color. And so in that vein, Felicia, you know, the way, one of the ways that you and I got connected um, was through your amazing uh, leadership, frankly, on the development of the county's first ever, speaking of firsts, um, the first ever racial equity policy. <clears throat> um, and I, I'll just briefly share <clears throat> before you speak that I remember hearing about that and thinking, who, who's doing this? Like, well, I've never heard of this before. Mm -hmm. And I had just been to a county commission, a uh, board of commissioner meeting where they were talking about affordable housing and there was no person of color in the halls of um, city city hall or the county um, building downtown. And then it felt to me like the, the use of the word affordable housing was even coded, mm -hmm. right? And I got to share a story in public comment and I remember locking eyes with you um, that night. And then I think you emailed me after. Um, can you talk about, you know, you, you mentioned that you love policy, that it's what's mm -hmm. called you into your work. Can you talk a little bit more, you know, maybe broadly, um, but also specifically about the process mm -hmm. of the social equity policy that was adopted as of last year? Sure. So the, the, the reason or part of the reason that I do the work is exactly what you were just talking about is that there are for far too long, um, uh, you know, and it's part of the system, so many voices have been missing. Uh, and, you know, as you just alluded to, there are, rare are the times uh, when, you know, we're surrounded uh, by folks who look like us. It's much more frequently that we're the only person uh, in the room uh, who may look, and, and, and bringing that experience in. And what I have found is um, in working in government is that sometimes I'm the only woman and uh, the only person of color in those spaces uh, and feel a, a great level of responsibility to be able to uh, bring in very different perspectives that are often just assumed as the way to go uh, or the thing to do. And so you know, the, the work of the, the racial equity policy, um, you know, I first had had dreams of be making it an ordinance 
uh, which would have affected the whole county. <laughs> so, um, I and know. Really wanted, <laughs> you tried. Really wanted to do that. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, when, you know, there was a small, you know, a couple of us who started talking about this um, and started doing this work. Uh, and when I first brought it to the, this idea uh, of doing a racial equity ordinance, uh, but it's actually a racial equity policy now, um, to our administration, uh, mm -hmm. I remember we were sitting in this room in, uh, you know, in the county, and it was, you know, me and a, uh, four or five other folks. And, you know, I said, I really like to do this. It's important. You know, and people, and this is not to say that there, this work wasn't being done before. That I, I, want, I don't want to be uh, mistaken uh, or, or misconstrued in saying that. Um, it's that we were choosing to do it in a different way um, and, and wanting to really, wanting to flatly acknowledge that racism exists, that the government has been part of exacerbating, creating uh, racist policies uh, and continuing to enact that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that we are a party to that here in Washtenaw County. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I brought this idea uh, to our administration, uh, I was told, it'll never happen, Felicia. Just flat out. Um, and, and, you know, I have great relationships with everyone in that room. And I just said, I, he I hear what you're saying, um, but know that I'm not giving up. Um, and, I, and I will be back. And, um, and so... You know, from there, what we when was worked, that, by the way, Felicia? Oh gosh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if it was 2014, 2015. Was it because we did that um, summit? Remember? Yes, the, in it 15. was around that. Okay, yep. yeah, I remember yeah. we did the summit where they laid okay. after. Um, mm -hmm. What was that? The Kerwin Institute came in yes. and mapped yep. the the opportunity index, yes. right? Okay, that's right. So we worked with. So you know, it was. You know, prior to that, we were already, I mean, we had this kind of vision of what we wanted to do. And the, the doing the summit was part of um, gaining this critical mass mm -hmm. so that, you know, administration could see, like, this isn't just something that I'm saying would be cool to do. You know, like, right. This, right. Is, this is meaningful work that's important and we really need to address um, and uh, and connecting it to for some folks, you know, they need to, they need data, Yeah. you know, and connecting it to the data in terms of, you know, I, I would often talk about when, when presenting this kind of a tale of two cities here in our County. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, and the disparities that continue to occur despite, um, you know, efforts, you know, and that, you know, we really need to focus this uh, because the greatest disparities that we see fall along racial lines. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, the summit that we had was the first kind of public thing that we did. Uh, this was, like I said, uh, you know, Deet and I were saying it happened in 2015. About 300 uh, folks came together uh, at WCC and we spent the day talking. And that was really focused on kind of really beginning this conversation, um, you know, encouraging folks to look at um, implicit bias. Um, a lot of folks around that time were taking, you know, the Harvard um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. quiz, not a quiz, but the uh, implicit yeah. bias test. The impl yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, you know, lots of you know, so we're encouraging folks to really start to explore that for themselves if they hadn't, um, and do that work. And the other thing that's really important is you can continue to take that because uh, you know, as Yodit said, this is we are we are all continuing to work on this all the time. Mm -hmm. so this isn't a finite process. Yeah, and so um, so we we did that, and then you know continued to just work. Uh, we worked with um, uh, a, an organization uh, called GARE, uh, which is the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, uh, mm -hmm. and they do this work throughout the country. Uh, and so they really helped us do uh, then a, a series of trainings, both for county staff, uh, and at that point we were working with the City of Ann Arbor. Uh, as well. And so, uh, you know, in, in my head, this was all leading to the uh, creation and writing of the, and acceptance, hopeful acceptance of the first ever racial equity policy. So, you know, I sat in our living room and wrote the first version uh, of that policy yeah. wow. uh, and then brought it to the community. 
uh, and we did several community meetings wanting to get input okay. from our community. Uh, I can tell you that along the way, there were people who did not want me to do that work um, mm -hmm. and tried to put up uh, many roadblocks, um, you know, sometimes while publicly saying that they were su supportive of it. Um, yeah. wow. you know, and so it, you know, the, you know, in doing this work, you become a target yourself. Um, and so that certainly is the case uh, with this work. And, um, uh, and then in September of 2018, uh, we passed it unanimously. So going from, you know, this will never happen uh, to all the years and years of work, being able to get, you know, that, again, that critical mass of folks. Uh, and what the policy did was it, it acknowledged racism. It acknowledged racism in our government here in our county and that we can do something about that mm -hmm. and it set up an office whose sole responsibility is to look at this is to mm -hmm. look at the way that racist policies play out and impact our residents and our staff and our organization uh, and to then make changes um, as you can imagine that that is very it's both wide and deep uh, and so that, yeah. that is, it's a, a, a Herculean effort uh, yeah. to do that. Um, and we have uh, an amazing woman leading that charge. Um, and it's, a, but it's a continual, it's, it's a continual um, sometimes battle yeah. to remind people uh, that, that this work needs to continue and shouldn't be either cut from the budget or um sidelined um because yeah. it's extra yeah i want to if i can I, um, um, maybe, oh go ahead desiree did you want to get in yeah i just wanted to say right quick you know so a couple of things that you're uh lifting up that i'm kind of like i just want to amplify one is just that in doing this work it's you know years right it's mm -hmm. not something that just pops up Yep. But, you know, it's like a lot of work to be ready for like a moment when yeah. other people are paying attention, right? You know, we yeah. talk about the urgency that's continual, but sometimes everyone doesn't feel that urgency in the yep. same way. And so mm -hmm. all that work, I just, you know, just want to lift up that that's so much of how change happens is that mm -hmm. there's a lot of time that's, that is kind of under the undercurrent in that, in that work to do. Um, and so, and, and then also just in terms of, thinking about now this, this, now we have this person, we have this office, we have this charge. And uh, I think it's important for us as a community to recognize that all that work doesn't sit with that one person, doesn't right. sit in that mm -hmm. one off office. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. it's all of us coming into that space. And there might be things where as a community, you know, as a group of people, we might say, what's an area of equity or something we, we really think that the county needs to look at. Mm -hmm. and you start that work you have to do some mm -hmm. some collection of some information right. with the resources you have and then you can share that and how much easier that then makes that work to then put the resources of the county behind there and I think yeah. that's something that I just want to lift I'll be bringing that up all the time of like what are the things that you know that seem uh not like you've been asked right and and doing our civic mm -hmm. work we're never asked to do the work that needs to be done yeah. Um, and so we need to start recognizing right. that. And in this area, you mm -hmm. know, what are the things that we could do to create shortcuts so that our government can start to uh, focus its energy and resources in the areas that we need it to mm -hmm. um, and uh, shorten some of that work a little bit if we can, if we have yeah. that resource, which, you know, yeah. we're in a college town, right? So we, we know we have a lot of those resources right. here. So let yeah, me just put a, 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 oh, please, Felicia. All I was going to say is that government is, as an institution, has a lot of catching up to do, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 moves at a glacial pace, mm -hmm. you know. And, and so, Des, you're absolutely right. There's there's so much work that happens that folks don't see, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to lay groundwork at least in government. Um, mm -hmm. And in my hope is that the more that we do that work, the faster and the more responsive. Uh -huh. we will be uh, because it, it, it's um, right now it, we, we're not where we, we need to be like we're, you know, we're far from it. 
Yeah, just for the context of our audience, because you know how it is when you're close to something and we've yeah. been talking about it for a lot. So one, could you spend a couple minutes talking about the ordinance versus policy? Sure. So uh, yeah. the timeline is that you'd started doing some groundwork prior to the, the um, opportunity, the Washington mm -hmm. Opportunity Summit, right, which is meant to kind of galvanize the community to inform, you know, you in your living room developing this policy <laughs> and getting folks, but like, you know, moving, shepherding the process, recognizing that it's important for the community to have voice in the development of what was at first an ordinance, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you, you know, there's like that groundswell of engagement and trying to get folks excited, but it's still, you know, five years. Mm -hmm. until and until so can you talk a little bit about i mean i appreciate uplifting kind of government moves slow and i want to continue this conversation that des lifts up about like this ecosystem level approach right not abdicating responsibility to government to fix it but but have so we're going to come back to that but can you just set us up a little bit like talk about ordinance to policy and sure. then just a little bit what did the policy say felicia sure yeah so uh, the reason why we couldn't do an ordinance, there are a couple of reasons. It's, it, it's really dictated by state statute. So here, in, because there are other counties throughout our country who do have ordinances. Um, but here in Michigan, if you have an ordinance, number one, you have to assess a fine if the ordinance is broken. Uh, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This, is, this work is not something to me that it's like, okay, now you owe this much money because you didn't like that that just did not feel like that didn't feel that wasn't what we were trying to do uh, mm -hmm. and um, you know part of what we're trying to do is have people recognize this know it's the right thing to do and you know and do it um, mm -hmm. the other thing that I will say is that even in asking other municipalities here in our um, in our county what I got from some was well, let's see how this goes for you, Felicia. And then, and then, you know, then maybe we'll think about, think about it. Um, and so that was also really interesting. And I think it, that also speaks to, you um, part of what, one of the things that, you know, kind of the frame that you set up for us today is, you know, that, that memory, like that memory of, um, or reminding ourselves that we're not frozen in time. Yeah. You know, and that people move. Um, but it's interesting because I, you know, those some of the communities where that was their initial response are now starting to do this work which is great uh -huh, you know like uh -huh. you know that but that's what takes uh -huh. years yeah right it you yeah. know it is like okay you may not see what i see now yeah. um but we're gonna work so that that you can uh -huh. see it yeah um and then we can all do this work together and so the ordinance again the fine was an issue and and also um wanting to be able to narrow it, although we wanted to do the work countywide, um, narrowing it because we need to make sure our, our own house, so to speak, was in order. Mm -hmm. And it, and it's not, you know, it wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, we still continue to have a lot of places where mm -hmm. we need to work uh, mm -hmm. and as an organization. Uh, and so it was also really wanting to focus on, you know, we want to do this work well, and yeah. and have it be um, something that actually mm -hmm. actually moves the needle and actually we're actually changing the way that we're mm -hmm. we're doing uh, whatever we're doing and you know there are lots of different ways this plays yeah. out um, and so uh, that's the other reason to switch to a policy um, yeah. and the policy you know you had a lot of emphasis on the inequity the compounding inequity yes. on the east side of the county that's right. right. Yeah, and yeah. in some of the rural counties. Yeah. That's right. It's, you know, and so part of what we would talk about is uh, in terms of that compounding inequity, you know, are things like, um, you know, a black man on the east side of the county lives 10 years less than his white counterpart on the west. In the Latinx community, it's 16 years. Um, test scores for our students on the east side of the county are, can be up to 30 to 40 points less than those on the west side of the county and you know I, I always say like and we know it's not because the kids are smarter on the west side like that's not the issue mm -hmm. um you know we are um like i think 80th or 83rd in terms of economic mobility 
-hmm. in terms of counties in the state. I mean, it just is, you know, it it goes, um, you know, those inequities go on and on. Um, Mm -hmm. And so part of what the the policy itself states is it's setting up the the office to be able to do this work. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, it also, you know, some of the things that we're hoping to do and looking at the way that the county is, you know, things like, or how are we operationalizing it? Things like, how, how do we hire? Mm-hmm. Like, what are we, what are the requirements that we're asking for? Um, all, are they um, things that we actually don't need to, that right. actually don't need to be part of the, right. the job description? And then are inadvertently, inadvertently having a whole set of right. folks who can't apply for jobs. Um, how right. are we promoting within the organization? Um, and, and what's that process like? Um, you know, when we look at our, our management at the county, um, you know, it starts to, to look a lot, it starts to be much more white. Homogenous. Yeah. yeah, much more yeah. homogenous and, and white. You yeah. know, and so yeah. what, like, what are we, what opportunities are we missing, beca- you know, yeah. in, in doing that and, uh, uh, and what's happening? Yeah. That that's, that that's how it looks when we know that yeah. that's not representative of our organization as a whole. Yeah. Um, and so there are yeah. lots of ways that, that this work plays out. And most mm-hmm. recently, um, a lot of the work that Elise Asbury Payne is our, um, uh, our equity officer. Yeah. Uh, so and, adopting the policy led to the development of a budget by the county, right? That yes. put towards yeah. a racial yeah. equity office and the hiring of a racial equity. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's right. Yeah. That's so, right. yeah. And we, we budgeted a quarter of a million dollars um annually and um can i push on that a little bit what's the county's overall budget so so what's interesting uh is that we're gonna get des involved here but i want to make sure people are seeing the way yeah yeah absolutely so um so there are a couple of things one um you know the budget is is that we have control over is a uh, little bit over 100 uh million uh, and, uh, and then there are also kind of pass through monies as yeah. well, but, yeah. um, you know, but part of what is part of what's really important and it's such a good point that you brought that up is when things aren't in the budget, they're mm-hmm. not a line item. It's easy for, for things to not happen. Yeah. Uh, so being able to get that lot, that budget item through was really important. The other thing that was really important and I had lots of, uh, conversations sometimes heated was the um in the in the county there are kind of like levels of jobs mm-hmm. and the level of your job depends on the the pay range yeah uh and so i had i had to push for this position to be a higher pay i think it's called a pay grade to to be a higher pay grade because initially when it was presented uh to me or suggest you know suggested it was lower and i was like What's happening? It, it needs to be at the leadership level, right? right. So it can influence the entire exactly right. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. That's exactly Hopefully right. Hopefully our listeners are hearing and seeing, right, the ways in which this translates into your own organizations and your own thinking. So already we've heard, you know, what are the barriers that keep folks that are working with us, whether that's, you know, requiring a college degree for a job that doesn't really require right. a degree, whether it is how we position folks of color in our organizations, have we really given them power in those positions, whether that's paid or not, even on your board, right? Not, not, you have to not just have the position, but the power that comes along. And then this idea of having a policy that, um, you know, you can point to and say, this is our way of of being. And so boards and and the league and others are throughout this, the the region are developing these commitments to racial equity as a policy, not just as a practice or words we say or statements Mm -hmm. we put out, right? Mm -hmm. Let me, um, I want to make sure... We get ample chance to get um, Des. Thank you so much for that, Des and and Joan. You, I'd like to get you into the conversation as well. And you feel free and come off a of mute and hop in anywhere you want. Um, but Des, you know, thinking about policy, you you mentioned the work of Liberate Don't Incarcerate and the ways in which your community engagement. If folks weren't watching. Uh, Des and the the group that comprised uh, Liberate Don't Incarcerate did uh, what I observed is a really fantastic job of of 
organizing at the community level to get folks involved in this really important prosecutor election, uh, pre, you know, pre-primary, and then I imagine um, into the November elections. Des, can you kind of talk, like what brought you into this organizing work and maybe, uh, you know, any part of your work you want to talk about, but I, th I thought the liberate, don't incarcerate to Felicia's point that government moves slow and it's, you know, a glacier, et cetera. You all in a relatively short amount of time did some really fantastic work. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, I'm just trying to, I'm like trying to think about how to tie together all the threats because I want to come back and say some things about budget things. Say too. whatever you need to. You don't need to follow my, my <laughs> say what you need to say. You've got yeah. like 10, 10, 12 minutes to do your thing. Okay, so uh, I'll start with that just because the complete this thread of thought, you know, um, around thinking about budgets. And I know since I've been involved in, um, kind of looking at government in a different way and kind of participating more specifically in our city council here in Ypsilanti in particular, you know, I, I go into public comment and I'm like, well, our budget is a value statement, y'all. <laughs> I was like, you know, this is where we're putting our money and this is where we're putting our resources and what we resource is what gets attention and will grow. Um, and so it's more and more in my organizing, I'm recognizing how important it is for us to be looking at and considering the budget and whether it's reflecting our values as voters, um, as the community, um, and to recognize that we have a role to play in, in setting that direction because this money is gathered from us and it's being spent on our behalf. And so um, it's just been really uplifting, like, okay, well, how do we start exerting power in the budget um, and thinking about what that looks like. And so I just wanted to lift that up as something I'm like, I'm kind of uh, in a lot of my organizing kind of starting to think about this more specifically um, in terms of, you know, how do we get uh, public monies into housing? Um, how do we get public monies, you know, into wraparound services for young people so we don't have to incarcerate them. Instead, we love on them in the ways that we haven't um, overall as an overall society um, and you know all these different things so anyway so I just want to say that about budget stuff um, and I think in terms of thinking about kind of community pieces and like how to get you know the word out and thinking about how to do things quickly I mean um, liberate don't incarcerate I think we had um, one thing we, we uh, I think we started off with coming together around relationships, you know, so uh, many of us had relationships with, you know, another person who was kind of being part of the group um, in the beginning. And so uh, I think that that's, that, I mean, that definitely is what pulled me in with uh, being called in through the relationships I had with some folks. Um, and then it was also this idea of, you know, taking, you know, so we were, you know, there's two big pieces of thinking or thought we were trying to pull together. One was, you know, abolitionism and thinking about, um, you know, this practice of uh, working toward a future that we can't see today. Um, and what are all the different things that that takes? So understanding that as a group and thinking about uh, how does that connect with just even people who don't necessarily see themselves as abolitionists, the people in our community and thinking about how does that kind of idea connect to what you want to see in the county prosecutor and thinking about how the legal system is at play within your community. Um, so there was like that kind of part of the work. Um, and then there is also thinking about like the county prosecutor as a role and function um, that a lot of people don't really think about that much. And I think more attention is now being played in these spaces. But, um, you know, I think in general, a lot of things that we elect people for, we don't necessarily know what those job descriptions are. We don't know what to expect from them. And, you know, something that we wanted to make sure to do is we wanted people to recognize the power that the prosecutor has. And so being able to, you know, in part of that process, we actually were working with young people. Uh, we, um, as a group, uh, co-hosted a youth forum uh, where we had young people uh, posing questions directly to the prosecutors. Um, and included a young person who's currently incarcerated. And uh, it was powerful. These questions were, you know, 
one of the things is that the questions were focused on these systems. They were focused, they were like focusing big. Um, but, you know, working with young people to say like, we want this to be, um, we want to make sure that the information is easy and digestible for the wide range of population that we're trying to communicate with. So it's kind of like breaking down what is this role in a really clear way. Um, also thinking about, you know, what are the resources we have in the community that we want to be resourced. Also thinking about for folks that were returning, um, who are returning citizens and thinking about, you know, um, what are, what is uh, for them really, um, what are they centering and what is it they want to see in their communities and, 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 uh, and then how are they connecting with people in their communities as well around, um, around all of this, right? And um, having the community to see like, oh, I see myself in that space. Uh, and at the same time, breaking down like, okay, now we have these candidates. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, in our space, we would say like, it's not that we want to be like, oh, we, we, we didn't endorse any candidates. Um, that's not the space that we want to be in. Uh, we want to say that whoever's in this role, how are you uh, aligning with our platform? So we had a platform that we came together, uh, pulled together that was really steeped in what was happening around the country. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we were looking at examples of other places of, um, and saying, what matches Washtenaw County? And, um, and so we had a platform and then we wanted to engage the candidate with this platform uh, and let them let us know where they fell, right? And then we were gonna share that uh, <laughs> so that, you know, everyone has all this information. And so um, we were able to, uh, you know, we had a, a survey, we had the candidates fill out a questionnaire. Uh, we had um, a, some uh, folks on the team that went through looking at their platforms that they had published as well as um, some of the forms they had spoken at based on our, you know, uh, pulling the, that information in. Uh, and based on all of that, uh, pulled together a scorecard um, mm -hmm. where we listed out these major parts of our platform and um, how each candidate scored based on that, based on their, based on their responses. Um, and, you know, based, and then we pushed it out. So we just made sure that we just made sure that everyone saw it. We did some, we went door to door. I dropped off like 200, you know, flyers. Um, we, um, yeah, you know, and good. because That's we good. wanted people yeah. to have that and to be able to connect it, you know, I to their it. value. Yeah, I love, I was going to say that, and I don't, I didn't mean to speak over you, but I love this idea of, you know, we talk, like, the, the league is focused on political education, right? And a lot of times when we're taking a, um, a nonpartisan, as, as you are, perspective, and even a, not necessarily endorsing a candidate, but really trying to engage the community, we have these, you know, there's, there is the come get the education, right? Or there's like, how do we translate you know, opportunities for learning into these ways that people can connect with? And that's what felt kind of distinct about your work in my observation, that it was, it was really um, translating political organizing for all intents and purposes into something we, each of us has experienced or, or is moving in, and that's a value system, right? And creating an opportunity. I wanna get Joan's voice in, and um, Felicia, there was a question earlier about <clears throat> how the racial equity work can be tailored for each community. Um, the work being done and the work that needs to be done is very different depending on where you are in our county. So maybe it's, yeah. that question is in the chat box, but I wanna get Joan in. Um, for some comments there. Joan, the prompt that I thought of was really like what, you know, sort of what inspired this for you, but I'd love to hear anything else you want to offer. Well, this has been good for me. Um, I, I have not entered into the conversation until now because I was trying to listen. Um, and in listening, what I hear are a lot of intersections between the work that Des and you and Felicia are talking about and the work that the League is committed to, um, many of our policies speak exactly to what you're talking about, many of our position statements um, about 
justice, about the environment, about education. And what I think has been missing is that we haven't known that you're working on that or have imperfectly known that you're working on that and that, that perhaps there are some things that we could collaborate on. Among the things I think we could collaborate on, Des, is that we do, um, we do candidate forums. Donna Crutter on our board it really makes a difference in highlighting what the, the questions are. And she asks for questions for candidates from the community. So I would urge each of you on this, um, on this webinar, including Felicia and Des, to, to send, and I'll, I'll put in the chat box the, um, the email address, send to us the things that are of particular concern to what you're working on so that we can look at those as we're looking at candidate forums. I see a lot of opportunity for us to work together with a community that maybe we haven't always understood was working on the same thing, or we've understood, but we haven't always reached out. I know that um, some people from the membership committee, Jackie Wolf and Chris Samita, have done a job of working, of lifting up what the league has tried to work on within communities that we haven't always spoken to. We're just pulling all of that together as we formulate the, the committee. I would urge anyone on this and anyone that you know to bombard us with information, to work with us, to partner, to collaborate as we expand this. Um, and then I'm going to, I'll put in the chat box to everyone the, the email where you can reach me with questions for our candidate forums. And I'll step back again because my job here is listening. Well, thank you, Joan. Thank you for listening deeply um, and thinking about opportunities to strengthen your ties to other community efforts. You know, we talked a lot in the planning of this session about and I think this is true for, for all of us. I've been thinking about it at new. How do we get more proximate to the folks who are boots on the ground, organizing in communities that are most vulnerable? How do we get out of our offices or, or at this point our living rooms? Um, out of, how do we uh, you know, come from behind the, the computer safely? How do we, um, I think the one thing I wanna maybe be a little bit more explicit about is, um, please don't all email Felicia and Des. They're all extremely busy. <laughs> but yes, build relationships. If you are in a room and you look around and there is no one that uh, looks like Des or Felicia or I, you need to be saying out loud, this is a problem. And that room can be a virtual room. It can be, you know, a, a actual room, a living room. If you look at your forums and there are not candidates that reflect the diversity of this community, we need to be asking before it's election time, what, you know, how do we cultivate and stir up the leadership in our community? I learned so much through our Leaders of Color Fellowship uh, and so many, um, and I will, um, it's the one time I'll sort of self-promote. I'm going to share our Champions for Change um, website, which is a page of 20 leaders of color, people who are already leading in this community who are not being invited into these conversations, nor are they being supported and invested in at, at you know, large scale, right? And so it meant a lot to me to meet those folks and to use our platform to uplift their work. So we're kind of taking a step back and centering the work of these leaders of color and using our positional power and influence to do that. And that's, very, that's an anti-racist practice. It is seeding power. It's not, hey, you can come to my meeting, which is often what inclusion means. We already have a table set and you can come here. It is actually seeding power and sharing that um, with others. I have, um, I want to uplift something. We had kind of planned for the last section to be breakout rooms. And yet when I'm looking at the gallery view, very few people are using their video, which makes breakout rooms challenging. And so I'm wondering if we want to decide together as a group 
to pivot a little bit to continuing our conversation. And this is going to, um, uh, I might ask the tech team, it might be better for us. I'll keep the conversation going and maybe we could do a quick poll of whether people prefer to stay in the conversation with some Q&A in the chat box or if you would like to move to break out <clears throat> to talk amongst yourselves. I want to um, listen to my intuition on that, you all, and allow us as a group to decide what's best. So option one, stay kind of in dialogue and conversation with question and, audi uh, question and answer from the audience or take the 15 minutes and go into breakout room to discuss what we heard today. Breakout rooms, please. Okay, oh, well, excuse me, Dee, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm hoping to design with the, the group, but I'll keep going while um, I'd love if people want to maybe even just drop their preferences into the chat box. I'm seeing a lot of interest on your parts. Um, Felicia, you know, I promised we would come back to, so thank you for sharing the, the policy itself. I wonder if you um, briefly want to talk about, you know, what are your invitations or calls to action to folks who are on today uh, in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we uh, practice, uh, lean into uh, increased anti-racism principles and practices? How do we uh, build belonging, you know, what, what would you invite of those who are listening today? So great question. Can I, can I put that on yes. hold that for a minute? And I just wanted to follow up on something that Des was talking about in terms of budgeting. Uh, one of the things that I've been suggesting for years at the county um, is that we, we start to engage in participatory budgeting. Uh, yeah. And to me, that is uh, a great way to be able to get uh, community uh, folks involved, understand you know what what we can and what we can't spend money on, why we like you know why there's and how we need to spend money differently, uh, and most importantly, and so um, that is also um, a place where I've gotten lots and lots of pushback. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I, and I think part of it this then leads me to your question, which is we often rely on the status quo because it's what we're comfortable with. Uh, it's what we know. We're comfortable mm -hmm. with it. For some people, it works. Uh, but for lots of folks, it, it doesn't. And so I think that what's new uh, comes with anxiety for people uh, and not knowing what, what it might mean. And mm -hmm. so I think being able to encourage folks to not be afraid of that, um, that, you know, yeah, we may mess up and that's going to be okay. Like we will learn from that mm -hmm. and then continue to, to, to move in, in that way, you know, mm -hmm. and move, uh, have those, those better and better approximations to where we want to be. Uh, yeah. And so part of my call would be to lean into the anxiety mm -hmm. uh, that this, that accompanies this work um, both when you work on an organizational level, but also when you work on a personal level. You know, I think one of the things that's really difficult um, here, and I, and I said this, I've said this in a couple of meetings with folks when we're doing this work, is that here in Ann Arbor um, and the, the county, what I have found is that uh, folks like to think about themselves in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is not as racist because it's uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and yeah, and but and yet it's happening. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it is happening, and and uh, folks are are um, perpetuating and, per and perpetrating mm -hmm. uh, racist acts. And if we continue to not name it and ignore it, yeah. um, we're gonna it's we're gonna keep having. It. But that again, I think butts up against people's um, sense of identity. Uh, mm -hmm. and in a really challenging way that, um, that a friend of mine that says that, that white silence leads to right. black death. Right? That's right. That's right. So yeah. it's consequential. Sure. It is consequential. And, and then mm -hmm. that leads me to the next thing in terms of a call to action, which is to believe people of color when we share what our experiences are. I mean, part of what I didn't really touch on, um, I mean, I alluded to a little bit, but, um, didn't share a lot about is uh, 
you have all of the the um, the roadblocks and all of the um, aggressions that happened in doing this work um, mm-hmm. in, in this way. And um, and for some folks, it's um, something that they've never experienced, so they don't believe that it could happen. Um, yeah. And I just invite invite all of you, you know, when when people of color are sharing their lived experience, you know, sometimes I'll hear, Oh, that, that you must've read it wrong or mm-hmm. you interpreted that incorrectly, or that can't be that person, yeah. you know, like that someone would never say something like that or do something. Or like, like it happens in the South, right? When That's right. Know that house had racist housing policies. And right. um, I'm going to invite Des to talk about yep. that in a minute, but please finish, finish your thoughts. This, yeah. this idea though, that it, that thing is happening somewhere else yeah. where this bastion of liberalism right. here in Ann Arbor, not here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so again, just inviting people to believe that, yes, it, it, you know, this does happen all the time uh, here and to, you know, instead of um, being afraid of it and denying it, you know, yeah. lo- wa- opening yourself up to, to learning more and then to doing something about it, to challenging it. Yeah. Did you think that just, yeah. um, <clears throat> go ahead. I was going to say just right quick too, as you're talking about like the idea of, uh, the pushback with people to try new things. I mean, one thing that I know I hear so often is, oh, well, you know, people don't really know or the community doesn't really understand uh, the complexity and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, this is one of the ways and we're talking about like the institutional barriers and different things. That's right. that well, if, if we always are at, well, somebody doesn't know and we're not going to do any teaching and educating. That's right that means that they'll never be able to be involved. And so I think it's so important in our different roles to think about, you know, what are the things that we keep just because some we think that people don't really get or understand and how do we get across that gap so that we, people have the tools and resources and understanding that's necessary and we get to the other side, which I think honestly is like even as basic as just democracy, you know, how with democracy mm-hmm. and how it works. We don't actually learn that. I didn't take a class in high school and I went to the most uh, prestigious of prep schools. <laughs> and, I, and, um, and so I imagine that other folks didn't learn exactly how to practice democracy either. And so um, I think that we need to break ourselves of that and just start, uh, you know, really start to uh, open up that and to think about where people don't know what is our role in opening that process. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and anyway, so I just wanted to say that. Well, I want to, um, I got the majority of people, we just had about six folks respond to their preference. And again, I, you know, I'm sure the tech team is freaking out because I they were, we were going to go to breakout rooms, but I was just sensing that folks are really listening. So the majority of people said they would enjoy listening longer, um, and then I thought maybe for Q and A, we'll do like, maybe we could do some smaller groups for Q and A. So why don't we speak for another 10 minutes as a large group, okay? And then um, Desiree, Felicia, myself, Joan, we can go into breakout rooms with our participants. And then it's a little less like you gotta talk to the whole group and we give particularly our introverts some, some smaller space to process. So Des, do you, you know, what are you, what are your, what are you thinking about in terms of calls to action or, or anything else that's on your mind? But Yeah, I was thinking a little bit about um, some different calls to action and some things that I think are important. One piece that I want to just say um, is that, you know, I think one thing is when we think about action, it's so um common to jump to like something external or something out there without thinking about what's in here. And I appreciated that conversation when thinking about for the county, that the county is like, oh, we got some work to do too. How are we going to make everyone yeah. else, right? So I think it is important for us to, to do that. And that, that is important action too, because um, to look within your own organization and to think about what barriers to remove. And I think it's important to think about with equity um, that a lot of times people talk about it like everything's um, uh, add in, like it's something you have to always add something to this um, mm-hmm. in order to reach equity. 
And that sometimes actually what we need to do is remove things. We actually have to take things out in order to reach equity. And so mm. I think it's important. Can you give an for, example? Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, it's interesting, actually. This is a conversation that we're having within um, ICPJ right now um, that I think is rele relevant to this. And is, you know, so we're thinking about um, staff uh, performance. <laughs> like, how do we measure that? And what does that look like? Uh, who's measuring it within our organization? Because we're a member organization. Um, but then uh, as the co-directors, as we came on, we're talking about like the larger community as well. And what role does that play? And so we've been having these conversations about, you know, what expectations do we have? And what are those steeped in? Are they steeped in what we need to be focused on today? Or are they steeped in a way of being that was from yesterday? Um, are they steeped in um, uh, an experience um, that was true in 1990, but is not true in 2020? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's the conversation we're having of like, okay, well, we might have to actually remove some of these things so that there's room for what we need to be focusing on. Um, mm -hmm. And also so that we can kind of breathe within that space, right? So we're an organization, a staff of two uh, with one uh, part-time person that's funded through a grant right now. And um, and so the kinds of expectations that we have, the kinds of little like nitty gritty things that, our mem that we get sometimes is feedback. Mm -hmm. And we're like, but how are we actually responding to the large question of um, keeping people in their homes um, mm -hmm. so they're not evicted? What are, and, and, and how are we as a community actually showing that we're responding to that, right? And mm -hmm. so... Um, and how do we get folks to be able to understand and empathize with that? And so how are we helping people to connect those stories? And that that to us is like, well, we would focus what kinds of things we want to be measured against, right? But yeah. we don't want to be measured against, did we get returned these notes from this email the next day after a meeting? Uh, so we have to then remove that from <laughs> the expectations right. and remove that right. from both like is there a performance metric but also is that what kind of conversations do we need to have with our community so that they remove that themselves too right so that they don't then put that on someone else later on um, and that we recognize mm -hmm. where that comes from and that's uh, that's part of that internalized piece that was in that video that we have to realize you know that we internalize white supremacy and and, and part of being anti-racist is for us to, and, and that's everyone. That's not, that's, that's the whole kit and caboodle in my mind is that we've yes. internalized these things and then we're measuring ourselves based on that. We're measuring yeah. ourselves on a sense of what's better, what's best, and who's determined that, you yeah. know? And um, so I think that we, part of being the anti-racist work is to actually be able to recognize what mm -hmm. part, what are the kind of thinking patterns that we've internalized that are garbage? Yes. <laughs> so that's, that's a call to action. Yes. I, it's like, you know, take out the trash that's in your mind, you know, and it's like, I've been it trying is. to do that myself to be able to say, you know what, what I bring is valuable and I don't need anyone else to name it that. And sometimes right. we get, we hold our own selves to this, to that place. And so I invite everyone to, do that work and it's hard I'm, I yeah. mean like I, I've been doing it's hard work and it's not friendly I mean sometimes I just cry in a workout just to work it out you know but yeah. it's emotional but you know what like what's more emotional like what I look for is that doing this work now if that leads to more peace and justice tomorrow if I don't have to teach my daughter certain things that I had to learn, you know, my mother, I remember, I feel it, I feel in my bones, her talking about, you know, you have to do two to three times. She, I remember having her, her having a conversation, oh, you want to lock your hair? Where are you, what kind of, what kind of professional job are you going to go into? Because if you are going into a business world, you can't have your hair locked, right? These conversations that I right. had to, that I had that was passed down to me, how do I make sure that I'm not passing that on to my daughter? And that yeah. to me is worth the hard work. It's worth yeah. it to, to go through it so that yeah. she doesn't have to go through it. Amen. Listen, I want to continue this conversation. Um, and again, I, I want to invite us 
uh, technology is not being my friend now, um, to um, move into our breakout rooms. You know, you inspire me so, um, Des. Um, and when we move into these breakout rooms for further discussion, and we're going to talk for about 15 minutes, the question I want y'all to think about is, or the, the prompt is, what did you hear today that you felt in your body kind of that shift either in thinking in your knowledge or awareness and then as members of the league how can we take you know what we what we are sitting with over this last 90 minutes um, how do we bring that into our membership and into our work so i just dropped those questions in the chat box and what's going to happen is like I said, Des, Felicia, um, myself, and Joan, we're going to go into breakout rooms. I just put the prompts. You'll get a, it would be best if you join by video. And it's also obviously ideal if you come off a of mute. Okay. And then we'll give you a five minute kind of warning of when to come back. And then when we bring you out of the chat, you have like a six, like a minute during the transition. So you get a chance to finish your thought. So amazing tech team, will you move us into our breakout room? That was very nice. Hey, um, did you get a, a message from Mary Ann? Could, could we have people... Or did um, she just send it to me? Could we have people muted, Rusty? The meeting. Um, apparently... Uh, Rusty, you're not muted. Okay, so let's just see how many voices we can get included here. <laughs> so our sincere thanks yeah. to you, I, uh, Des, and Felicia for your important work and for the generous gift of your time, your energy, and uh, just your, your, your hearts. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I thought this was just going to be a lot of intellectual kind of thoughtful kind of stuff. And, and it was a lot more. And so uh, thanks for helping us get on the road to acknowledge our history as a League of Women Voters and transform our future. And many thanks to our fabulous tech team who were vamping all over the place and did a great job. Uh, Shelly Shanfield, Mary Ellen Hagenauer, and Susan Woolley, who is our Director of Communications on our board. We also appreciate your uh, participation and we encourage you to check out all of the upcoming offerings from our local league chapter, as well as we have on-demand past presentations on such things as voting in Washington County, the importance of the post office, and a link to our own YouTube channel. And our website is, if you can see it right behind me, lwvannarbor.org. Lots of goodies there. And coming up on our September 25th Lunch and Learn session is our own Doris Limke, who is a published author, who will introduce the book she has written about this national, state, and local history from the League's founding 100 years ago. The book is titled, We Would Not Be Denied, and include some of our local league members and some of the issues that they, in which they've been engaged. And by the way, everybody who's here, if you're not a, yet a League of Women Voters member, including our wonderful uh, panelists, uh, or you have, have let your membership lapse, there's no better time than now to join and to share with, with people who are interested in the issues that you're interested in to join as well. Just go to uh, lwvannarbor.org and you can join there. Remember, for the League, that ensuring each citizen has the opportunity and access to the vote is not just a good idea. It's a constitutional right. So my friends, stay well, stay safe, and we'll see you next month for Lunch and Learn. <laughs>